so excited that your input to today, because what we're doing today can actually be classified as an experiment rather than a performance. Because first of all, I can't even have um, with any kind of style, because all of these three amazing masters that are joining me today, they're all great at what they do, but they're almost stepping out of their comfort zone to do what we're about to do. So it may be such a disaster, or it may be something <laughs> amazing, but as I've been thinking, that, that was, uh, I think that was a kind of perfect introduction today. It's like, what's this, what is this improvisation? Well, it's life, that's what life is, right? Every step of this improvised. We get up in the morning and something happens and we have to adjust. Some things we cannot control, some things we control, we think we control, but then they go their own way. So, all the musicians that we are, that were in here, they were all great improvisers. Starting with Bach, during his lifetime, Johann Sebastian Bach was considered an amazing improviser on, on the organ, but a kind of mediocre composer. <coughs> Unfortunately, we can't take his improvisations now. We just know what is on paper, and we know how great he was. But we can only, <laughs> we can probably not imagine how great he was when he was uh, uh, <coughs> improvising on his organ. Uh, Chopin, another great improviser. Beethoven, he improvised for a long time, and contemporaries uh, wrote down their thought. They were crying. We will begin with Johann Sebastian Bach, his famous Ariolo. And uh, for those who know the tune, I think it's interesting that uh, this is not your usual place. And maybe I should place it here, or I should there. Please welcome Harry Appleman amazing pianist, tourism composer. <laughs>
piece we're going to do is actually based on uh, a familiar song. Uh, it's by Schubert, actually. And the reason we're doing this is because um, I knew a singer when I was just in high school who was like a kind of model of authenticity and beauty in how he, uh, how he presented himself, how he sensed music. His name was Sanford Sylvan. And just last week, uh, he died very suddenly. He was like in his mid-60s. And he's been a colleague and a friend, an amazing teacher now as well, but just like one of the most heartfelt voices that I've ever, that I've ever experienced. He was, uh, that quality of being heartfelt was especially uh, vital for him when he would sing things like Schubert's songs. So we decided that we would base this next one on a Schubert 
Schubert song, which actually comes from the Die Schöne Müllerin, if you know that cycle, and it's the very, the very last song, which is called Des Baches Wiegenlied, which is like the, the lullaby of the brook. Very, so it kind of sounds positive most of the time, but the text goes somewhere very dark, which is basically, um, I will take you, I will accept you, just in other words, a kind of, there's, a, there's a suicide or a drowning happening underneath it, but it's so full of love, like the water itself just accepts the person who wants to go somewhere else. So we will do um, uh, uh, variations on that. Mm-hmm. 
yet. We're doing one more. We're doing um, one more improvisation. So far, so good. <laughs> okay. So to keep the good tempo. to make me nervous, I know. <laughs> now we're going to continue. You see, the style that you just heard, you can put many tags on it, but can you really name it? Can you really put it in a box? I don't think. But um, improvisation took a form of science for jazz players. A uh, good example of is Miles Davis. Miles <laughs> Davis was considered a... Uh, uh, Savant mathematician when he was playing. The way he was uh, working out of these intricate rhythms and harmonies. So when I met uh, Harry and Victor, we have met before, but when we started to work together, I felt like it was a totally new realm, another ground that is unknown to me. Now you will have a chance to witness what they're doing, the two masters. I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Vicky Botkin and Harry Adelman, and they will announce their own time.
first composition of Hey Dear, a great composer uh, and school of art.
<laughs> Thank you.
Because you could just your own piece, or should I talk about it? Or oh, uh, it? there's the piece, uh, the next one, there's the piece I wrote. Um, based on, uh, I, I did some work with a, a vocalist from Afghanistan, I believe. And uh, both Victor and I have also done some playing with the uh, Indian tabla player. So both of these guys um, study and play uh, Indian classical music. So uh, that just a little bit of exposure to that, just enough to be dangerous. Um, but this piece is based on a, a raga known as Shri, so um, I call it the Shri.
Permission, and then we will continue with questions and answers. There will be a discussion. So, about ten minutes.
I've got, a, I've got a seat up here for you. And I've got Victor's got a chair here, so. Anybody? Okay, we're about to start uh, discussion, questions and answers. I hear something. Great. So um, we have to keep the discussion concise. So please, um, um, you don't need to be, um, how do I say, overly praising if you don't like something. Actually, we're more interested in hearing that because you see, this is something which was really great to practice for because some of the practicing was done as a regular practicing, but some of us what could not be done in any way. Because you cannot practice for something that you cannot control. So you can only prepare yourself. That's why our ego, at least in, I'm speaking for myself, my ego is totally on zero level right now. So if <laughs> I'm open to all the criticism, and um, please uh, go ahead and um, 
ask your questions or express your opinion, or we're, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. I just love to say one thing while we're grabbing the microphone, which is in martial arts, uh, uh, one of the axioms is the person who wins is the one with the least history, which sounds strange, but what that has something to do with improvisation. In other words, it doesn't mean the least experience. It just means you bring the least amount of expectation of what is going to happen to the moment so that you are totally 100% open with all your nerve endings to what is happening right now. And that's improvisation more than classical music. So for me, that's a, that's mm. a very exciting um, shift. It's a very good way to put it, actually. Maybe we should hear the masters first. Yeah, why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, me? Um, I was surprised that nothing, uh, nothing fell apart in a very obvious way. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it, it's a new experience for, for me anyway. Probably, maybe for all of us. Um, but actually, just talking to Jim a few minutes ago about how we all feel time. Uh, there's some interesting things to think about there because I guess jazz players, you know, you're supposed to be keeping the time of the piece, but, it, but it's never metronomic. It's always you are familiar with how this person plays the time and how this person plays the time, and you know certain things they do that indicate that they're maybe pushing a little bit here or holding back a little bit here. But we didn't have the same uh, vocabulary for that that I would have with jazz players so so we had to kind of uh, listen more but that's the key I guess is just listening intently. The, the way I describe it for orchestras is you, I mean also it's 80 people as opposed to, to four but an orchestra needs to have a kind of a slightly more rigid sense of pulse and they can't quite trust their guts as much as the great jazz musicians can do. It's like sometimes the beat isn't there at all uh, uh, you can't hear the beat in great jazz musicians. You just everybody's feeling it enough in their in their their belly, so that when they s kind of set loose, still they always land at, at the same spot. Um, which orchestras are sort of, sort of more reliant on people like me conducting them in order to make that happen. Which which is a kind of authority element, which just isn't there in jazz. Well, uh, I'm classically trained. Was in. Uh, my kind of late youth, and I quite understand uh, the differences in time interpretation since we're talking about time. So I can say that uh, actually that was harder probably for Tanya to stay with us than for us to stay with Tanya, because uh, the first time she is dealing with jazz musicians who pretty much restricted time-wise. We don't move time when we play our jobs, our concerts, whatever. And uh, in classical music, if you play really even, they will tell, well, this, it's not even interpretation. This guy's like metronome, he's not very interesting. And uh, the conductor can kind of uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for instance, there is a task. You perform a piece which is supposed to be 10 minutes long. And then you stretch something in between a minute longer in between, then the next piece of that should be a minute shorter. So you keep the total time the same, but time stretches in inside and shrinks inside. That's not actual oppos op opposite to what happens in jazz. We don't stretch time, we don't shrink time. We keep time, so because it's a pulse, it's kind of erotic, danceable movement. And uh, so I have to congratulate Tanya because she actually dealt with it quite well. It was a uh, pressure on her, I think, and pressure on us too, because uh, in in the real real gig in life, we don't really completely free improvise. Just improvisation, and what we're doing today, it's a little bit different. We have a restricted number of harmonies inside, and we improvise on those harmonies. Is it rondo in classical music, right? You 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 you, you write different melody on the same left hand, right? for instance, so that was absolutely a combination of genres and you can call whatever you want, but it's all Tanya's idea. We just came to, 
to help her out. Any thoughts from the audience or any? Okay, so that, that the last one, Blue Shri, was particularly interesting. And you, you talk about the first place my mind went is channeling, somebody's channeling their inner Dave Brubrick because <laughs> it, it could have almost been on his Time Out al album. And you, you talked about time, and of course, Time Out was a study in time signatures. So. I, I, what I really like to hear what are some of the influences that got you into the place to produce something like Blue Shree? Yeah, that's for you. Oh, okay. Um, well, it was, um, I guess, again, my, my limited work with uh, these musicians who were students of uh, Indian classical music. Um, that particular uh, raga called Shri. And I should say, um, there's mo it's it's deeper than uh, just we talk about scales. We have scales we use in jazz, and they're usually seven notes, or sometimes eight notes, or six, or whatever. Uh, raga is this one includes a group of seven notes, but there's a lot more to it that uh, I am aware of, but don't know. You know, there, there's how you move through the scale. Certain things are uh, approved, and others are not. Um, so I just wanted to get that out that I'm not a, a master of this in any way. But I, I heard uh, this singer, the vocalist that I uh, was referring to, um, was playing around with that particular raga in a sound check, and I happened to catch it on video and just got kind of obsessed with it. It's just an interesting set of notes. And there's a rhythmic element um, and that's interesting, the Brubeck comparison. I hadn't. Uh, hadn't thought of that, but uh, there's a an Indian tradition uh, for a rhythmic organization system also, the Tala system, I believe, that's uh, the way we ended was uh, a figure that's repeated three times. There's a, it's a very mathematical thing where you eventually come out on one after repeating something three times in, in uh, diminishing intervals. So that, that's called a Tehai, and anyway, this was our sort of uh, gringo attempt at a Tehai. <laughs> Hopefully that sort of answer, or at least addresses some of those issues. Okay, so when I was listening to you guys, I was like hypnotized and uh, it was a magic. And I would like to know when you, because uh, when you playing, you actually taking turns. Do you feel the same when, I mean, the how you influence each other? So do you feel kind of the same? So I'm used to being in a situation where my mind has to work very actively. My mind has to be out in front of the music making, um, and my beat or uh, my soul has to be with the music making. There was something about this where there, having no plan of how long the piece was going to be, where I didn't need to worry about the future at all, and actually any active thoughts would get in my way. So uh, in that hypnosis is partially not living in the past, not living in the future, just living completely, being mesmerized by right now, yes, this felt more hypnotic to me than I'm used to feeling um, on a stage. And that should have made me nervous, but for whatever reason, it didn't. I was trying to get nervous the last couple of days, and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> I woke up this morning, it's like, I'm going to get up on stage and do something I've never done before. And it's like, I couldn't find it in me to actually be scared of it. So, so I'm like, okay, maybe that, that's, that's part of it anyway. Uh, this is uh, this could be taken deeper, what what you're asking and, and what uh, yeah and, and hypnosis, but more of um, what is creative process. Is um, how much of uh, how much of it are you controlling really? Because there were there were movements in music, 
uh, in last century when people thought that they can create works where they control everything, they could mathematically uh, calculate the uh, value and I mean, the duration and the position of the notes and um, that embryon didn't live. No. So is this is this something um, is this something I actually was nervous this morning, mm -hmm. quite because I was not nervous even for myself. I was not wasn't more nervous about what are we doing <laughs> and how the audience will react to this. But it wasn't anything to do with the, with the performance. So this is this is um, I believe this is an ideal situation for a musician actually. Because in order to make it interesting for yourself, you are mobilizing everything that you know and everything that you are. But in the last moment, you have to ask for grace. And this is wonderful because it's easy. It's not you anymore. It's like mm. being, a, being a vessel of some mm -hmm. kind through which things are kind mm -hmm. of passing. I mean, maybe all mm -hmm. art is that. Maybe all life is that more than we think, but certainly in this particular situation, the more you actively get involved trying to trying to think about things or game things, uh, the less cool stuff can actually just start to happen. It's all nerve endings and and like beta waves rather than kind of alpha brain waves. What do you think? Uh, well, everything uh, these two were saying brings true very much for me because it's uh, we probably all had the experience uh, earlier on of stage fright of some kind, or you know, being in a situation where uh, some famous player walks in and is watching you or something. I know I've been paralyzed the time uh, Herbie Hancock happened to be in the room when I was playing. You know as if Herbie cares what I play. But uh, anyway, um, th the way that I've been able to get past that and get to a place of just being in the, in the moment uh, just involves um, getting, kind of getting lost in the, in the sound that it's, you know, it's, it's easy to say and very difficult to do, of course, but uh, with, years of playing I guess you're more able to uh, to let go of all those thoughts and uh, and t just try to focus on what comes next you know it is definitely a channeling thing um, letting go of your any sort of pre-planned ideas and following what you think is the next thing that should be heard well the, the question was about it do we get mesmerized with what we're doing? That would be very good, actually. Uh, I think uh, it doesn't matter is it jazz or not jazz. You know, we should have asked Richter if he was mesmerized with what he was doing on piano. But there's a balance between your heart and your mind. You cannot lose your mind. You can play with no heart. Eventually somebody noticed that, said, well, this guy is boring. He plays well, but he's boring. So the question was, I think the answer is we, we balance things. You have to be involved. You have to show who you are. But at the same time, you keep the cold head. Sometimes I'm losing my head, unfortunately. So. What was interesting to hear to me was that Tanya actually didn't use the uh, jazz attributes like jazz sound or, or emphasizing the second and fourth uh, parts of the bar, you know, of the measure, which is, uh, which is kind of standard thing in, in jazz. And nevertheless, it all blended quite well. I, I was listening to the clear, clear cello sound on, on top of this kind of foreign uh, environment for her. And, and th this produced some 
some effect, I would say. I don't know if it's expected or unexpected, but, but for me it was, I didn't, I didn't think that this, that this is wrong or out of place. I think it was quite appropriate. It was a program that didn't have many backbeats. That's true, actually, too. Mm -hmm. Just exactly mm -hmm. the boom, back boom, two and four. Mm -hmm. which oh, is it's actually one. one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the jazz. Yeah. So, so, mm -hmm. so there was no such thing. And nevertheless, this was improvisation. And it, mm -hmm. it really was, was improvisation. And there was a dialogue. And it's just like a mm -hmm. different person came to the room and they all found uh, the common language somehow because mm -hmm. there was a dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess... That's not a question. It's a uh, that's <laughs> yes, I think, I guess that, that was, you said, was it expected or not? I guess that could, have be, could be expected and that's what happened because uh, when uh, idea um, popped up in my mind, it was more about... Um, which is basically um, doing something with James. And then I thought, but it's not enough. And we know that there are these wonderful jazz players here, right here, local, and I always enjoy it. And we, we even tried something together a couple of years ago. And then I decided to step out of my comfort zone and try to knead it into one whole program. We actually had this discussion with uh, Victor. He said that you know it cannot be just here and there and here and there because uh, it will be too chaotic. It won't be meaningful. The programs have to be meaningful. So I hope that we did manage to do some kind of a, in spite of our multi-stylistic um, material, we managed to do some kind of a story, starting with Bach and then introducing a bit of Schubert and then going into the jazz standard and ending in this free composition. Mm -hmm. I would like to add mm -hmm. one thing that just came to my mind. Uh, probably many of you heard this famous recording of Stefan Grappelli and Yehudi Minuchin, right? They, they play, uh, they're supposed to play jazz or impro improvisation, but the thing is that uh, there was only one improviser there. Mm -hmm. There was uh, Stefan Grappelli, of course. Minuhin most likely wrote his part, learned it and played with his beautiful sound and everything, but it did not produce any effect. It's impossible to listen to this record. <laughs> I, I, yeah, this is, this is really, if you know jazz, you won't be able to, to, to listen to it. it it's, not, it's not really music. But here, what R except for what Grappelli tried to play and his group. Because it absolutely doesn't fit. He just ha has something that he, he plays. Uh, reg regardless of what was around him and whatever. Just, just he played his part and went home. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> So, so this is not what happened here today because this was spontaneous improvisation. Can I say two quick things? Um, one is that I would have made myself personally nervous if I thought what I was going to do was get up here and really sing. Because when I hear the word sing, it's like that means I need to be an actual trained singer, which I'm not. I'm just a sound maker. Right. And so when I, dis when I thought, like, you can make any kind of sound as long as it's sort of expressive and as long as it's connected to what's around it. And then just now with Tanya, we were figuring out, actually, just what I was trying to do was talk with notes and with sounds to, uh, to my partner in those pieces. So that was very exciting. But the other thing, the second thing I noticed is that how you listen to us in when we're in the midst of improvising, when you can sense that the next moment isn't planned, but it's being made up in front of all of us, including the people on stage, that leads to what I sensed was a different kind of listening, the best kind of listening, a sort of activating of the silence around the music, which I find inspiring. I feel like I can actually dream up better stuff based on how you're listening, because believe it or not, that's palpable to all of us here. That's where great performances come from. They don't come just from the stage. They come from something that's happening that's involving every single person in the room. 
Yes, the uh, things that didn't happen today, um, they didn't happen because you didn't want them. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of responsibility. So. Yeah. Uh, just to okay. pick up on, oh, on Jim's point, uh, that, I'm sorry, I'll, just a short uh, thing to add on there. That, that's kind of how I ideally think of uh, a jazz line, it, relating it to um, the audience in some way, even though there's plenty of times when we play and there's only a, a few people listening and a, a otherwise uh, a large audience of people ignoring you. But uh, but at least you, uh, for me, you start with an idea, a line or something that uh, you know people will understand. You know, it's like start with this point and then I'm going to take it to the next step and see if I can keep your attention. You know, so it's all based on a perhaps imaginary uh, concept of leading the audience along your story, so to speak. We, we like concert very much. Thank you very much. And I have a small request. Could you play a little bit more? <laughs> I just want to note. Yeah, there's a question. Um, uh, this gentleman here in the first row. Oh, oh, just to pick up on what you said about the listening, I just wanted to explain because the jazz convention is to clap after solos, and I couldn't do it because I was hanging on the notes today. Like I needed to hear. I didn't want to miss any of it, so I was just listening silently. So I just wanted to explain that to people who are used to hearing clapping. It's not that we didn't appreciate your solos. Which is hilarious because the one time I asked, a couple of times I asked at the University of Maryland when I taught there, uh, the audience to please clap whenever they wanted, in between movements, in the middle of movements, and there's a certain kind of music which lends itself to that, uh, one that has real chapters that end and a little bit of like breathing time before the next thing gets going. But, but our audience, even though they were invited to clap wherever they wanted in the Beethoven Symphony, they could not find a moment where, um, uh, where, there where, it, was, where it was episodic enough for that <coughs> to make, make sense. So, uh, so yeah, that's fun. That's fun what you're saying. No, no, I thought that this shows the moment We're so fragile. <laughs> well, yeah, you talked about being mesmerized and being in the moment. But it's still, when I listen to something like that that I'm not prepared to listen to, I'm, I try to be in the moment, but at the same time, I'm a, my mind or whatever is imposing layers or patterns and, uh, of what's happening. It could be more than one. But, but I can kind of fit myself into a, you know, a, a, a pattern of, you know, musical occurrence, kind of. And that's the way I best can appreciate it, ultimately. Um, instead of just, you know, I can't just do this note, this note, this note. That's just the way I listen. I, I think most people probably listen that way. We listen by gestures, we listen by phrases. This thing that we think of as pulse is actually a very alive thing, and rhythm is not the same as pulse. So actually our, our sense of rhythm is different than our sense of, of pulse. Rhythm is a little bit freer in a certain way, and there's a kind of aliveness to rhythm when it's really good, that where like the pulse can actually be kind of rigid, but the rhythm on top of that has a, has a certain uh, quality to it. And I think all of those things, you can listen into them. Some people enjoy the pulse, like living with the pulse. Others with the rhythm. Others, as you're saying, with the, with the gesture of it somehow. <coughs> and maybe now and then if there is a melody, you kind of like kind of go with that. So, so it's, it's multifaceted. And, and the other thing I wanted to mention was how good my brain felt after the rehearsals we had together. It's like a totally different use of the brain, like a part of the brain, I think, which I'm going to assume is a little bit, hopefully, of the, of the joy of listening to, to this kind of music for, for you guys as well, because there's no expectation of what the next thing is going to be. So you, you're listening with um, parts of your brain that, that are open to anything. Well, I think the interaction of the rhythm with the pulse is what makes it all work. And, and of course, there's the melody and harmony and all that, but speaking specifically of, you know, the time factor, I think without the pulse, I think the rhythm would, wouldn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, there are hypnotizing elements in music, and the most hypnotizing one is considered to be the time. 
Because if you um, if you listen to uh, a drummer, an amazing dum- drummer or tabla player, um, you you will just you know trance. Just this this it seems like it's a massage of all of your chakras, uh, and that's that's breathing. If you add a sound texture to it, right, the dynamics, it adds to it. And if you add, um, I mean, then it, it all is. I guess you can uh, speculate which is what kind of instrument was the most, uh, the oldest one. What would you say? Is the heartbeat. <laughs> 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 You he- have heard of these stories, right? That the uh, older um, musicians complain about the younger musicians playing everything too fast, <laughs> and the younger <laughs> musicians complain that the oldest are just slowing everything down and becoming really boring because they don't get the uh, they don't really get the groove. They don't understand. What do you say? Well, I think you, you made a good point about uh, it's the interaction between the rhythm and the pulse that makes it uh, exciting. For me, listening to a jazz player, it's uh, how they phrase, you know, where they put, for example, typically it's eighth notes in a, in a bebop context, but, it, you know, players don't put it right on the beat or it's not a strictly triplet thing, but... The, in jazz, it's often based on triplets, so there's a whole lot of variation in where how people interpret that, and people play behind the beat, and that's what uh, gives it the spark of life to me is is how you how you phrase things and how you're hearing the time. Yeah. Oh, and you know, something just occurred to me uh, while I was calling out. Um, if somebody asked the famous baritone and bassist Richard Disco. Mm-hmm. What was the most important element of music? Which I think is a false question, but he said, "Rhythm." <laughs> yeah. 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 Great, so let me just. Sonny Rollins had a great line, um, which was, uh, "Rhythm is the positive, and harmony is a negative that you have to get through to get to uh, to get to rhythm, which is the positive." Something along those those lines. So agreeing with what you said. And also, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. That applies to every single music, yeah. Um, a quick question. Uh, during the concert, we hear some sound like it's some radio station working or something we'll like that. Yeah, we'll that. Uh, was it uh, intentional or was it... <laughs> no? No, it wasn't ever radio. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you hear it on a station? <laughs> oh, no. We didn't hear it on stage. Um, I would like to do one more composition for you. One more question. Are you going to continue? Because it's really unique beginning, what you've done today. So what's your plan? Yeah, second time it won't be that easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we... Um, uh, I personally uh, think that it's it's the the potential is infinite. Yeah. Absolutely, mm-hmm. it's it's a beginning. But we'll see if uh, these guys don't get tired of me. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that uh, today we commented. Uh, uh, Jim actually commented that um, our rehearse rehearsals w- in the rehearsals our improvisations were shorter, and today we actually expanded them and they still um, were quite coherent. So it seems that they have potential to grow. We'll see. We have some podium. We can write pieces. You know, you yeah. can write. That's a good idea. Yeah. 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 You can just create this podium, your own podium. I feel especially gratified that there is no percussionist in the group, so I feel like I can actually, as I did, like I kind of use the percussion, the percussive side of my voice as well as the singing side, and I'm probably prouder of that. So. We'll conduct your conducting. <laughs> okay, so we're about to play something that we haven't rehearsed. So let's see where it takes us. It'll be a free composition.
very much for truly thankful that you're here and you're part of this. And thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kevin.